So Terence, maybe, maybe we could start with you. Um, what was the genesis story of, of vinyl and how did you become involved in it? I'll give you the really quick version. In 2007, I got a call from Martin Scorsese who said, listen, I'm doing a project set in the world of rock and roll with Mick Jagger. Do you want to be part of it? And I was like, um, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, that was like the easiest answer of anything I've ever been asked in my life. What was it like the first time you saw the credit executive producers, you know, Terence Winter, Mick Jagger, Martin Scorsese. It's not an exaggeration to say that Martin Scorsese is the reason I started writing. Taxi Driver was the thing that got me interested in movies. The first album I ever bought in 1973 with my 13th birthday, birthday money was Goat's Head Soup. And the show's set in 73. Now to think that I'm working with those two guys is just, I, I really truly can't believe it. And, and Bobby, you, you, you play this uh, re, you know, record company founder and, and the show kind of goes through your character's sort of genesis story. How did you get involved with the project? I was working on Boardwalk Empire with Terry and um, that's how we met. And uh, about halfway through the season, um, he asked me to read the script. And like, you know, like Terry said, it was the same thing for me. It was a really easy decision. I mean, the script was amazing. Um, and it was uh, pretty epic in scope. and. And, uh, and he said, yeah, so I think we're going to do this. HBO's going to do it, and Mick Jagger's going to produce it, and Marty's going to direct it. And, and so I said, oh, yeah, all right, I'll do it. And, and Max, you were, you were sort of part of the family as well as, as it were, is that correct? Yes, I worked with uh, Terry and on HBO in uh, The Sopranos and Boardwalk Empire. And Terry, you, you said, you were telling me earlier that you wrote the, the role specifically for Max, is that? Yeah, Max, uh, for some reason when I came up with the idea of Julie Silver, Max was the guy in my mind, and I just prayed that Marty would see the same thing in Max that I saw. Marty, of course, was a huge fan of Max's from Boardwalk and, and many other things, and immediately he saw Max, Max came in and read and he went, yeah, oh yeah, that's the guy, absolutely. And so that was easy. Max, what's it like to have a, a, a part written for you like that? Oh, it's uh, immensely flattering. Thank God. I mean, thank God. Thank you, God. Someone noticed my talent. <laughs> and Olivia, how did you come to join the ship of pirates, as it were? Uh, I came on late in comparison. I, the script was done, and it was, I think, spring of 2014, because I was hugely pregnant. And they said, they're making this. These are the people involved do you want to come on board? And I was like, well, when do they start shooting? And the original start date was my due date. And I was like, yeah, I can do that. I will do that. Um, I was thrilled. I mean, it was just such an exciting group of people to work with. And luckily, they pushed a few weeks, so it all worked out. And, and Terry, how much, I mean, you know, you write these roles, and then people come in and inhabit them. How much do, do you mold the characters to the actors once you've got well, them in the room? You, you do it subconsciously. I mean, after, uh, it's, it's really great to start to see, when you start getting the pilot footage back, that's really the first time that, as a writer, I'm actually introduced to the real character. It just, uh, as the years go by, the seasons go by on a TV show, you start to realize that the actor themselves has some of their personality or man mannerisms has actually bled into the fictional character and that's certainly starting to happen here. And, and Max, as, as you said, I mean, the, the pilot was directed by Martin Scorsese. I mean, I just can't imagine walking onto a set and being, what was that like for you? So I had no idea what to do and very nervous to work with Marty. I didn't know what to expect. Um, and then he's so playful, he rehearses and you just suddenly feel allowed to uh, improvise and try things and play and then he feeds off of your energy and you start feeding off of his. And next thing you know, it's like this collaborative thing. What was written on the page was really, really special. And then he'll take it and just like light it on fire. And it becomes a living thing all of a sudden. He didn't literally light my script on fire. No, he? no. Oh, OK. Good. Thank you. <laughs> I had the pleasure of visiting the set at the end of last year. And sometimes uh, you visit sets where an enormous amount of expense and detail has, has gone on has gone to make these fabulous things what was that like to sort of create that and, and, and to come up well, with that's, that that's sort of the fun I think of, of depicting an era where you are in these kind of cheesy offices and even the the exteriors too we were laughing yesterday saying I'm probably this is the first job I've ever worked on we, we literally have to bring our own garbage to our exterior sets because New York City in 1973 was there was trash everywhere we even had our various consultants from the record industry walk through the office and say and I would ask them what's missing what are you not seeing here? What are you seeing that bumps you? And uh, just the little details of what kinds of magazines, what little doodads people had on the desk, and it all goes into that. And what's it like, uh, talking to the actors, what's it like 
wearing these clothes from the 70s? And, and do you ever wear anything that you're like, actually, I, I, might, I, I might borrow this for, for the weekend? Yeah, I want all of it. And then I look at the extras, and I want all their clothes, too. And then I take notes, and I'm like, I want that one, I want that one. It's amazing. I mean, John Dunn, our costume designer, is brilliant and they work so hard to source as much real vintage as they can and they're buying from London and Austin and California and to to give it that real authenticity because I think as a viewer you can sense the textures and they really add to to the whole picture and Max how much does it help to be wearing that that stuff and sort of in I mean that office really is like the inside of a smoker's lung essentially yeah I mean you step on on the set <clears throat> and you're in the world I mean every little detail you put the clothes on and you walk on set and you know, you're almost, a lot of your work is done for you. You look around, every, all the extras and background people are milling around, it looks completely beautifully in place and uh, you just enter into that world. And Bo Bobby, you, you actually get to wear, I mean, you can carry off, you can, you can certainly carry off a lot of this stuff better than I could, but, but what, what's it like for you to wear that? I think for any actor putting on the clothes and putting the shoes of the character on is an important part of the process. Uh, but I think it's, it's, it's extra helpful when you're shooting a period piece. I would say the only thing with this that was frustrating for me was that none of my pants had pockets. That was the only thing. So I had like a guy carrying my cigarettes at all times. And so that was the only thing that was kind of, <laughs> was kind of it's weird. It's pretty satisfying having all the guys be in heels. It's about like they just understood us a little bit more. And Terry, is it true? I mean, this was, so this is set in 1973, which is when Scorsese shot Taxi Driver. Is it, is it true that you use Taxi Driver as a reference for, for the, for the uh, show? Marty, uh, yes, shot, the, shot Taxi Driver in the year that this is depicted. And there is a piece of B-roll footage from Taxi Driver actually as Richie's POV shot in the pilot episode, which is just incredible. Yeah, it's like two pimps, right? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's through the uh, window of a moving car that actually is, is supposed to be Richie's car, Richie's limousine. Uh, which for me is, is, is such a great little Easter egg because, again, Taxi Driver is that movie that changed my life. And to, to see it as part of something that then we all became part of is just incredibly satisfying. Corner of 42nd and 8th. It's a great shot. It's like there's an Applebee's there now. And it's these two pimps, and one of them's got like a, like a sleeveless vest on and a hat and boots, and it's a killer scene. And he just dropped it in to the middle of our pilot. It's so cool. Um, okay, we're going to throw it out to the audience for some uh, questions. Hello. Uh, this question's for the cast. I'm just curious about if you can talk about the process of getting into these characters and sort of uh, transporting yourself and us, the viewers, back to that time. So for me, it's a matter of remembering that a certain amount of the cultural revolution hadn't happened for women yet um, and kind of reminding myself not to jump ahead. I think it's all in the script. And you just give yourself over to the script and the circumstances there, you know. And uh, I also always tend to like study maybe 10 years before the time period is set. So for like Julie, think like the, the, the era that shaped him was probably the 60s, most, more than 50s and 60s. So I looked a lot at that too. Yeah, very similar to Max. Um, I had the material for a really long time, you know, so, so I had Terry's ear and I could ask Terry a lot of questions and, and read up on the books and, um, and really I treated the guy like a king, you know, a king in his kingdom and, you know, and I, so I really allowed the guy to have a lot of license to do whatever the fuck he wanted and, and, um, and I never really got a chance to do that and so that's really what I'm sort of running with. Hi, so you all talked about the rehearsal process, and I was wondering if you can go a little bit more in depth, if you can compare it to your experience in theater. I would meet Marty in the morning at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock in the morning, and we'd have a little something to eat, and then he'd go, okay, so these are the scenes we're gonna run through today, and, and we'd talk a little bit, and then like Max would come in, Max and, and the guys would come in, the A&R staff, let's say, would come in, and we would work on the A&R scenes, stuff but really we would talk for about an hour hour and a half and marty would tell a story let's read it let's read it and then he'd read it and then he'd you know he'd laugh and then he'd go okay now what would you say what would you say on your own without the script just forget about the script for now sorry but uh, rehearsal so so and then we would do that and then he'd laugh and then he'd go oh that reminded me of this and again it was all just it was just really getting comfortable with him, getting comfortable with each other. He just prepared us. He really, really, he just loves actors, man. Will there be more seasons teaching these, these historical factors, especially within hip-hop and, and that community of, of music? 
one of, one of the main things that attracted us to setting the series in 1973 was that that was the year that punk, disco, and hip hop were all invented, if you will, within about a six month period of each other, within about five miles radius of each other. You know, stay tuned. I think by the end of the season, you'll see how we're starting to explore the different genres as well. Hey, um, I just wanted to know uh, how it was to work with uh, Mick Jagger, and maybe for the actors as well, and are the Stones in this world? Um, and just talk a little bit about that. Uh, first question, I mean, it, it obviously, Uh, you would never know that you were talking to one of the biggest stars in the universe. Uh, he incredibly gracious, collaborative. You know, just once you get past the starstruck stuff, he's he's really really fun and cool to be with. We have used uh, some Rolling Stones music in the show. You've already heard "Under My Thumb." Uh, I think we maybe use something else later on. And it's not to say that we won't um, have the Stones depicted at some point in the future. I'm wondering who it is that you are speaking with and consulting with and getting this information with, like the NEW reference and like a lot of the other stuff and just the way it goes in the office when you're having a meeting and, and all of that. Some amazing consultants, Danny Goldberg, uh, Kate Hyman, Nigel Grange, uh, Johnny Barbas, uh, Alan Grubman. Uh, these guys come in, they meet with us, they read our scripts, they come in and sit with my writing staff and I and just tell us stories, we pick their brains, just to keep it authentic and you, we just have these guys uh, just looking over our shoulders and it's hugely helpful. Everybody, thank you so much for coming. You've been thank a great you. audience. Thank you, everybody. But please put your hands together for Terry Winter, Bob Cannavale, Max Gazella, and Olivia Wilde.